and welcome to episode 29 of your Bamboo Chalupa digital marketing podcast. My name is Brett Snyder. I am the president of Knuckle Puck, and I am joined by my co-host, Nate Shiver, the author of ShiverWeb.com. Hello, hello. So today we're going to be talking about a topic that we actually get a lot of questions for, not only through the podcast, but I know Nate does as well over on ShiverWeb, and that's talking about tips for beginner SEOs or business owners looking to kind of get their feet wet and get started in SEO. And we focus on a lot of kind of medium to high level topics here, but an understanding of the fundamentals is extremely important for you know growing businesses and, and we want to make sure that we're serving that audience as well. So today we're going to talk about the top tips for people looking to get involved in actually doing SEO for a particular website, citing some tools, all of which will be recapped in the show notes. But the very first thing and the way we always try to kick this off is the purpose for this is we want you guys to educate yourselves. Yeah, and there are plenty of beginner's guides. You know, I think the most famous one is the Moz Beginner's Guide to SEO. Google has a SEO starter guide. But I think to start the whole educational process is to learn what you're looking at. You know, it starts with really looking at Google and being Yahoo search results, you know, look and see, you know, when you search for a keyword, something that, that you're searching for yourself, what results are displayed, what types of sites come back, you know, what, what is Google trying to show? What is, what is a title tag? What's a meta description? What, what are the each, what makes up each element of the search results that Google shows, you know, what's the difference between the organic and the paid listings and how does that translate into, you know, the different things that people are looking for and what they do when they end up on the website that they click through to. You know, SEO is ultimately just a grand experiment in reverse engineering. You, know, you have to understand the elements of the search result, what you're actually trying to optimize for before you can implement any tactics to accomplish that. And one of the other really easy Easy ways that beginner SEOs can educate themselves is to become familiar with the popular tools. You know, before you really get started, you have to understand the basics of these critical tools that I know Nate and I have mentioned on a number of episodes. I think we even did an entire episode on tools for SEOs. But there are really fundamental basic ones like your Google Keyword Planner, you know, Open Site Explorer, Ahrefs for checking backlinks, you know, Webmaster Tools and Google Analytics. You know, the more that you practice using these from day one, the more you're going to learn about your efforts and the better you're going to get at applying the insights that these tools actually provide. In the long term, this is really going to help you, but it's very difficult to go back and try to establish these best practices once you've really got things rolling. Yeah, what's great about the SEO industry is that a lot of these tools, and in fact, most of them are free. I mean, all of Google's tools are free. You can log in, play around with them, um, learn what to look for, and even the premium tools, you know, Ahrefs and Open Site Explorer and a lot of the other ones, they, they have free trials that you can, you know, log in, test them out, see if it makes sense to you, see if um, it's something that you could use um, and that you're interested in. You know, and there's always alternatives to tools that maybe don't have the right workflow for you. And I think one of the things you're going to be faced with as you're getting started in SEO is this paradox of choice. You know, it comes to there's so many tools you can choose from. How do you pick? That paradox of choice also applies to the amount of information that's out there. You know, the overwhelming majority of SEO knowledge is publicly available and honestly publicly sourced. You know, there are agencies like Knucklepuck that will write about tactics and best practices to be able to you know, reinforce our subject matter expertise to potential clients. But there are also sites like ShiverWeb that exclusively publish resource content. You know, ShiverWeb is in a, kind of an optimal content marketing case study for quality here because the success of that business is predicated on the strength of the content that Nate writes. You know, he doesn't blog to demonstrate the value of consulting services like Knucklepuck will. You know, Shiverweb.com makes money based on the number of people Nate is able to reach with his content. And he does that by ensuring he's only publishing this extraordinary in-depth content that will help beginner and intermediate or advanced SEOs be able to expand on their knowledge of, of how to do this effectively. Yeah, and and it's not just me and not just Knucklepuck. I mean, that this same practice extends throughout the SEO industry where we're all trying to educate each other. I mean, it's it, in many ways, it's a self-sustaining industry and we rely on mutual education to succeed because, you know, like Brett said, it's this grand experiment in reverse engineering where all these agencies, all these publishers are 
sharing information back and forth, trying to figure out what works best for SEO. And so, I mean, I mean, you can go out and find key influencers or key companies, you know, places like Moz and Search Engine Land, you know, have very reputable SEOs um, who write on, you know, on those platforms. They also share a lot on, on Twitter. You know, you can subscribe to their blogs and apply the tips that they're constantly churning out. And I mean, th- there's there's almost an unlimited wealth that you have to fo- be sure to focus on tactical, actionable tips that you can go and implement and, you know, stay away from the high level kind of vague strategy stuff. And these people, these subject matter experts in our space, love sharing this information. You know, people are very approachable. You can start a conversation with someone on social media. You know, it can lead to actually maybe seeing somebody at a meetup. You know, there's a number of different ways that you can take advantage of these relationships. Now, if we go kind of take a little bit of another path, something else to be wary of when you're starting out on an SEO campaign is to be realistic about your goals. You know, we're going to talk about pursuing things like long tail keywords as opposed to your head terms, you know, in the early stages to be able to establish kind of some of that initial trust, authority, and relevance. But we want to set attainable goals for ourselves and realistic KPIs. KPIs, for anybody who's not familiar, are your key performance indicators. It's basically how are you going to gauge the success or failure of this campaign or of this project? You know, what is the goal of your website? Is it to drive leads, to drive sales and revenue? downloads, ad impressions, you know, all of this information is free in tools like Google Analytics. And so, but we have to understand what we're looking at and what we're trying to learn from this information before we're able to apply it the way that, you know, will be most effective for us. Right. And, and on the flip side, I think it's essential to not buy into the myths of bad KPIs, you know, don't buy into the myth of virality that, you know, you could, but that by doing SEO, all of a sudden you'll get tons and tons of visibility just because you're doing it. Or, or that the goal is to go viral. Exactly. You know, that's that's exactly. not a realistic or attainable goal. Yeah, and, and, and I think the same thing goes with rankings where, I mean, having good rankings usually correlates with having good organic traffic. But that's in and of itself is not a KPI to aim for the same way that you would aim for organic traffic or sales or leads or downloads or whatnot. Right. Think about, like we used with the Shiver Web example, think about what it is your business does to make money, and then how can the website facilitate that? Those are how you build your KPIs around things that are going to have bottom line impact on your business. And the last thing to remember here, and this is a kind of a phrase that has stuck with me for a number of years, but SEO is an investment. SEO is not a cost. And when you think about doing SEO, you're looking for this long-term quality, this sustainable results. And so when you look at this as an investment of your time and resources that will pay dividends now and in the future, it really should help you understand it and be in the right mindset to be able to go out there and pursue SEO for your site. I like it. Well, when you're going out and pursuing SEO for your site, there's three aspects that most SEOs break the discipline into, technical, on-page, and off-page. And so... The first few technical tips are technical, um, and for me, it imagine all- that. <laughs> oh yeah, well, it's it's the foundation. I mean, the, uh, if you go back to educating yourself on how search engines work, you know they they work by accessing, crawling, and then indexing your site. And so, for search engines to be able to do that, you have to have a website that's built with a platform that produces HTML, you know, something that search engines can easily access and read. And so that means, you know, not using a Flash platform. I think hopefully Flash will be dead very soon. You know, not iframing, not producing a video that's behind, or not producing a website that's, you know, purely video, you know, not having a website that's just purely images, using a platform that produces clean URLs with HTML that search engines can crawl, you know, that's not overrun with tons of parameters or random alphanumeric gibberish. Um, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of ways to build a website nowadays. Um, and I, I think making sure that you have a platform that sticks to the fundamentals puts you a very long ways ahead in the game to start. And especially for small business owners, you know, I almost always recommend WordPress. Yeah. You know, that's that's even, you know, for our beginner tips, I got a little bit more in the weeds, I think, than we had intended. But really, if you find a platform like WordPress that, you know, thousands and thousands of sites are, they really meet that 
that model for small businesses. They have their way of editing page content is in kind of that WYSIWYG format, the what you see is what you get. So it's very intuitive for people who don't have a development or a technical background to be able to make up you know, changes to the site as we move forward. A couple of the other things that you could do, and we alluded to this earlier, make sure you install Google Analytics from day one. It is free and one of the most basic platforms. You know, all of these kind of basic platforms like WordPress or if you build your site on, you know, on a Wix or a Squarespace, they have how-to guides for installing Google Analytics. The thing to remember here is that Google Analytics can only track information from when it is installed. If you install it six months after your business launches, it can't go back and retroactively pull the information from six months ago. You want to install it from the very, very beginning so that you have a full and complete look at your existing traffic, but also trends you can start to see year over year, the growth in certain landing pages you might be targeting. So make sure that you get Google Analytics installed immediately. The flip side to that is Google Search Console, formerly Google Webmaster Tools, and Bing has a Webmaster Tools. These are free dashboards that the search engines will essentially give you information about all the criteria Nate was talking about at the beginning, about search engines crawling and indexing your site. They'll let you know whether or not your images are being found or if there are issues with your site or if you are at risk for a penalty or you have a whole large number of broken pages. Google, and Google Search Console and Bing Webmaster Tools will give you this information. Right. And then once you have that data, you know, from Webmaster Tools, analytics, and you have a kind of a game plan of what you want to be able to change. Um, the last thing I'll say is that you want to have a platform that allows you to easily edit uh, metadata and page content. And a lot of times for a lot of businesses that goes back to a platform like WordPress that allows you to easily edit um, the titles of your page, the meta description of your page, and go in and edit your content without having to talk to a developer you know it we're to stick on the wordpress theme you know wordpress has a lot of plugins like i love yoast seo that is it's a plugin that that makes it super easy to make basic seo changes you know right below where you enter in your content you can type out a custom title tag custom meta description you can even you know change the url and it'll give you a little um, a very basic grade a, a sense of direction so that you know you can um, know if you're on the right track and all that integrates super easy you know if you get kind of those basic foundational things in place and you go on a site like wordpress you're going to be in a good spot as far as your technical foundation once that is set, this is one of the parts that most people are familiar with when it comes to SEO, and that's dealing with the on-page factors. Now, this is what you say about on your site. This is the type of content that you write, the way you describe your products or services, the way that you link from one page to another, you know, the way that you're actually going out there and sharing news or writing ongoing you know, content doing ongoing content marketing to be able to push topics relevant to your audience. You know, we talk about these on-page factors here. This is really what can we do to make sure that our website is reflective of exactly what it is that our product or services are designed to, that audience they're designed to target. Right. And, and, and on-page SEO almost always starts with keyword research, which is figuring out how your audience searches and and figure out what they're looking for so that you can craft pages that meet their needs and try to create better experiences than the pages that currently rank for the keywords that that you're trying to compete for and so remember that's what google and yahoo and bing are looking for they're looking to return results that match with somebody's search query Using the content on your site is how you help them draw those connections and, and bridge those, you know, the consumer and the business side through the search results. And, and you know, just to pull in an example, you know, if you have a fashion website and your collection is called Special Occasion Dresses and you go in and do keyword research and you find out that, well, most people are looking for Cocktail dresses, you know, it's, it's kind of the same thing, but 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 that distinction by having a page specifically targeted towards cocktail dresses over the more generic special occasion dresses allows search engines, search engines to understand that yes, this product, this page is relevant for when people are looking for cocktail dresses, and by updating your page to fit that theme and make it more targeted, more exact, you know, that's something that will increase rankings which will then increase traffic which will increase sales and new customers all coming from organic search 
Right. And when we talk about this, the, the thing to remember is that we cannot make people search. As SEOs, we are in, you know, we have to be present for the types of queries that our audience is already making. We're not dictating the language they use when they type something into Google. So with keyword research, we're really trying to, again, that, that idea of reverse engineering. We're trying to say, okay, what are people looking for? Because that's going to tell me what type of content to write so that I can serve that particular need. You know, and this doesn't just mean repeating keywords over and over and over again. It doesn't mean that you just say, hey, if you sell cocktail dresses, that you write, you know, your content says the best cocktail dress cocktail dresses from the, you know, top cocktail dress store in the cocktail dress industry. You know, you don't just continue to repeat the term over and over and over again. It sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud, and it sounds ridiculous when you read it on a website. So you want to make sure that you're not just repeating keywords, but you're using them tactically to be able to try to decipher what the searcher wants and building your content to meet those needs. And that goes into you know the concept of long tail queries, and and a lot of times for a new business or for business first starting their organic efforts, this is where you're going to win. So long tail queries are variations of a more generic broader term so cocktail dresses is a longer tail search than dresses and if you want to take cocktail dresses and make it even more long tail you know it might be cocktail dresses for winter or black cocktail dresses for winter and the basically the more specific you make your term the more specific you make your page the more the more likely you are to be relevant for people looking for that term. And and a lot of times if you are first starting your efforts, this is going to be where the low hanging fruit is very early in the campaign. And it's what allows you to kind of build those relevancy factors to go after the larger terms. You know, you got to you got to crawl before you can run kind of thing where you want to build up to that. We're going for this long-term sustainable posts and you know and that sustainable strategies rather and making sure that you're going after long tail queries and building up you know using those realistic goals is going to be extremely important when you're planning on how to attack all these different keywords one of the things you want to avoid is having lots of overlapping or duplicate content that cannibalizes or, or you know makes it to where you're competing with yourself and so I, I've always found it a, a really good tip to create a keyword map or an information architecture, which sounds big and complicated, but really it's just a spreadsheet of all the pages on your website, what that page is about, and what are some terms that that is that that page is relevant for. To make sure that you have everything laid out, so that you're not you know competing with yourself, shooting yourself in the foot, so that you have a very clear website layout that not only you can understand, but that search engines can understand. What we say at Knucklepuck with this is you want to have a consistent and consolidated keyword focus, meaning that you want to consolidate all of your ranking signals for a particular theme around one page, and you want to reference that theme consistently throughout that page. You know, if you start to, you know, having a keyword map like Nate talked about lets you understand what keywords you're targeting to each particular page. You're not overlapping or cannibalizing your efforts. It also dictates the way that you're going to write your meta title tags, you know, for and your the content on that page. You know, your meta tags, and Nate said this is one of the things that you have to have with regards to your technical foundation. But when we talk about meta tag meta title tags, to the search engines, this is like the headline of the newspaper. You know. If it gives them the chance that you have one opportunity to tell them exactly what your site is about, what that primary focus is for that individual page. Title tag has long been the number one on page element that we can impact. It's the very first thing that I know Nate looks at, that I look at whenever you, you know, somebody asks you if their site has been optimized properly. You know, these are the things that you want to get in place and using the keyword map helps you maintain that consistent and consolidated keyword focus so that your title tags, the content on the page, the internal links are all referencing the appropriate keywords to each page so you don't cannibalize your efforts. Yeah, and let's actually talk about the content itself. That is, you know, the importance of having relevant, fresh crawlable content you know I, 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 when when people first map out their website I, I think one a common misconception is that that is their entire website I even though it seems obvious I don't think a lot of people realize that your website can expand that you can add more content you can add content that addresses common questions that addresses concerns that you can you know write content that you know you're trying to get 
press the pickup that you can ex- expand it in all sorts of ways. And the key is to write always to write content that's descriptive, that's detailed, that's unique. One of the best ways that, that I found to do this is, you know, w- once you have, you know, your products and service pages mapped out to create some sort of resource section, uh, a dedicated area of your website that you can easily expand and add new content. And when you're adding content to a resource section, it's sort of akin to building a brick wall. You know, every time you add a brick, a new piece of content, it stays. And just because, you know, you may promote it on the day that you publish it, that piece of content will keep driving for years to come. And so the more bricks, the more content you add, the more organic traffic, ideally, that you'll be able to drive to your website. You know, one of the most common content resources, you know, Nate calls it a resource center. A lot of people will call it a blog. You know, writing to a blog is one of the oldest, you know, marketing, not even SEO really, but oldest marketing, you know, strategies that people will recommend. And there's a reason for it. It gives you an ongoing dialogue or at least, you know, semi-dialogue monologue with your audience. It gives you an opportunity to tell your audience and the search engines as well who you are, what you're doing, how you're, you're, continue, you're continue, continuing, continuing to serve that audience. By starting a blog early and writing to it once a week, you're being able, you're positioning yourself to give the search engines much more information about who you are, the type of audience you serve. The more information and context you give them, the more likely they're going to be to rank you for queries related to that subject matter expertise. You know, for New businesses in particular or people just starting on the website, blogging is going to be a major challenge. And it's going to be at least six months before you really see any return on it. But again, SEO is an investment, not a cost. We're looking to the long-term value of this. And if you make a habit out of blogging very early, it's a great way to attract visitors, It's but you have to commit to it. Yeah, and there's a couple things that I'll add to make sure that you can set yourself up for success. And number one, I think Brett, Brett said it, and that is sticking with it. You know, it's going to be six months, but that process of adding bricks, eventually you'll, you'll have a wall that, that is something that will draw traffic to your site, but it's going to take a while. Um, second, you know, don't be self promotional. I think a, a common pitfall for bloggers, especially blogging for business, is to use it to promote your business. But again, that's not the goal of the content. The goal of the content is to bring in people who are who have questions, who are looking for things related to your products and services, and to give search engines those additional signals that, you know, if you are blogging about how to outfit for a cocktail evening, that you are likely to sell cocktail dresses, that that type of thing. And there's also plenty of ways to find what I call pre-qualified content ideas, i.e. instead of brainstorming or guessing at blogging topics, do research within, I mean, that I wrote a huge post on how to find content ideas, whether it's, you know, looking through keywords or mining your social networks or just keeping an ear open for what customers are asking about, you know, if you can produce content on what people are already looking for, that's what content and SEO is really all about. And if you're looking for any additional tips about the content process in general, we actually did a three-episode series on Bamboo Chalupa, bringing in kind of ideas from the planning to the execution and then into the promotion aspect of it, which segues nicely into kind of the last aspect of SEO, the promotional side of things, or your traditional marketing and PR approach, and that has to do with those off-page factors. You know, off-page signals are what separated Google from the herd when, you know, in the late 90s. Everybody else was looking at these on-page, fi- uh, on-page signals. Excuse me. They were looking for what you say about yourself. They were looking for how, what type of complimentary content are you producing. But then Google came along and said, well, the fact that somebody's writing that to their website doesn't necessarily mean they're the best option for it. It just means they have the best writers. If we look at sources from other websites, people who are willing to link to this site, to endorse that site, then we know we have a true authority on our hands. Google, from the very beginning, has incorporated these off-page signals in determining where websites rank in their search results. And so part of any successful SEO campaign needs to at least have a general strategy in place for securing these off-page references. And the, the, the first and lowest hanging fruit is to claim all your legitimate business listings, you know, to make sure that you have links where 
users and search engines expect you to be. This is especially critical in, in local business, but also true for online only business. You know, if Google expects you to have a local business page, have a local business page. Make sure it's fully filled out with all the correct information and with a link to your website. You know, if, if consumers expect you to have a Facebook page, have a Facebook page. Same way for Twitter, for Yelp, for, um, you know, if, if you're in a very specialized industry with a big industry trade journal and that trade journal has listings of all the companies in your industry, you should be there and you should have a link to your website on there. And, and a lot of times this is very low hanging fruit of just the owner, you know, or, or employee sending an email and making sure that you're claiming what you should have claimed. Right. And this is a way to saturate your brand online. You know, these search engines will look for these signals. Nate made the point where, you know, be where your users and your search engines expect to find you. You know, back in the day, this was, I could say that I have a business, but if I'm not in the phone book, nobody's going to trust me that I have a legitimate business. We now have an online equivalent of that. You know, there are things where search engines expect you to have your, you know, as Nate said, your local business pages, primary social media accounts. Maybe it's Better Business Bureau or, you know, or other large local platforms. You know, by being present in these places that search engines look to validate your, you know, your authority as a business really helps hammer home on the algorithmic side. It gives them the signals that they need to look for. The other things that you want to do when, you know, talking about off pages, set up Google Alerts, which are free. You can set up to say anytime your brand is mentioned on the web. This lets you know if people are talking about you without linking. This lets you know if, you know, there are opportunities to start to get involved. In, you know, you can look up your brand name. You can look up other, you know, searches. If you want to say, hey, I want sponsorship opportunities for a Little League team, you can start talking about Little League and sponsorships that when those become available, you can potentially engage in that and get some links back to your website. You can set up Google Alerts for anything that you want, and they will get an email or an email digest that lets you know all the references to those terms that Google has found over the course of that day or week. Now, the caveat here is you can get a lot of spam or a lot of you know, unnecessary things if you don't, don't use the right alerts. You know, if you set an alert for things like suitcases, you're not going to learn a lot if you're a small emerging suitcase retailer. You, know, you want to be able to find things, again, setting realistic goals, but setting realistic you know, alerts of things that you feel that you could contribute to that conversation. Google Analytics Alerts is something where you can actually, it's the other side of it. Google Alerts lets you know things that maybe you hadn't realized right away. Google Analytics Alerts for referral sources will actually tell you if a new site is driving traffic to you. It lets you know that somebody maybe is talking about you or linking to you. You may be able to enhance that relationship. You may be able to say, oh, I didn't realize that this niche in my audience is actually something that really responds well to my product. I should look about being a little bit more aggressive in marketing to that audience. You know, setting up these, you know, these automated tools that will give you insights about off-page opportunity, you know, lets you, you know, let the, the ideas come to you rather than having to go out there and manufacture, you know, these processes and these tactics, you know, from scratch every single time. And when you go beyond, you know, brand alerts and local business listings and start to try to get more links to your website, I think the rule of thumb is to keep in mind that quality always trumps quantity and that if something sounds good, too good to be true, especially in the SEO industry. It usually is. You know, Google is smarter than you. And if it was easy as paying someone to build you a bunch of links or buying a link building package that would boost you to rank number one, then everyone would be, would be doing it and everyone would be back to square one. And so I, I think that the key is to think of link building and getting these off page signals as something that's based on relationships it's not something magical it's not something super technical you know it's 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 really comes back to traditional marketing you know it, it's about making introductions to people who share the same audience as you you know not just making pitches to people but looking at, at ways that you can give them something for their audience whether it's you know information or an interesting piece of content something that would help another website so that they will eventually, you know, link back to you or, or share an audience with, with you. You know, and it's about being genuine and authentic. You know, relationships cannot just be manufactured, but Google and Yahoo and Bing and these search engines are trying to map your relationships. By building genuine, authentic relationships with influences in your space, people who you share an audience with, people who you share a goal with in terms of being able to, to service a particular set of consumers. 
you know, creating those genuine and authentic relationships is really the foundation of any good marketing campaign. And it supports that ultimate goal that we talked about. I think I've mentioned it at least three times already on this episode, but that idea that SEO is an investment and not a cost. You are doing this for the sustainable long-term results and investing in sustainable long-term relationships is a great way to be to, you know, to pursue that. All right. You can find previous episodes, links to things that we mentioned, and our contact information at bamboochalupa.com. If you don't want to miss another episode, go subscribe to the podcast in iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And do leave us a comment and rating while you're there. We learn a lot from your feedback, and your ratings helps others to discover the show. So for Brett Snyder, I'm Nate Shiver. Thank you for listening.